Okay. All right, everyone. Welcome to week four of the SF Fellows Program. Um, time flies. Okay. Time flies. I can't believe that we are almost midway. And you guys have been hearing a lot of great progress from your mentors uh, on your projects. And I'm hoping that you've migrated through the problem solution part. You're in this evaluation space, right? And you're doing this backward design as you go through the logic model thinking, hey, what's next? How do I execute to get these <laughs> results that I am hoping the outcomes, right? And so we're gonna continue this theme of evaluation. Last week, we had Sarah kind of give us the high level overview. Today, we're gonna to continue talking about evaluation and I'm super excited to have um, Valerie uh, Knight with us today. And quick fun story, Valerie and I connected uh, this past fall because I was writing an NSF grant and I went to the informalscience.org, uh, which I know she told you guys to visit. By the way, there was some homework and I know a few of you did the homework. So thank you for looking at that curriculum. But informalscience.org is a really great place. And if you haven't explored it yet, Sarah said it last week, Valerie will say it today, I will say it again. This is where I get uh, I connected with Valerie. She has written, my God, numerous reports, <laughs> NSF style reports. And I was reading them and I was really excited about the way she's put these reports together. And I knew that to uh, contact her and say, hey, would you, can you help us out with this grant? And, and that's how we started our engagement. And it's amazing that we're here today. So she's very well, well aware, very familiar with the SAF Fellows Program because she has seen it on paper. <laughs> the whole thing opened up. <laughs> and so she runs the Knight Williams Research Communications um, and specializing in the development and evaluation of educational media and outreach projects targeting diverse audiences. So a lot of expertise there. And I'm hoping today will be really kind of a deeper dive into the practical nature of doing evaluation. Uh, and feel free again to please ask questions about her career and so forth. Um, so Valerie, with that, welcome. Thank you. And it is a great pleasure to be here. And I have so enjoyed working with you. You're right since the fall kind of pre-COVID and here we are <laughs> hopefully on the tailor end of COVID. But um, so yeah, I'm gonna share my screen because I have a lot of PowerPoints. Um, and I'm one of the things that Manuel suggested was that um, I try to kind of walk you through um, projects and give you a sense of really how we approach evaluation. Um, so that's what I'm gonna do. And that'll be the first kind of half of what we do. And then the second piece will be looking at the fun homework that I find related to actually writing questions, just going in the trenches and just trying it out and getting some feedback. So um, to start off, let me um, share my screen, see if I can get you, get that up here for you. Um, Right, so I, uh, I have been working um, in this area since about 1991. Uh, prior to that, uh, I got into this field. I heard you ask that question last week about how did you get into this field? Um, and all the people you'll see here, um, including myself, really didn't get into it by being a childhood, you know, um, sorry to be an evaluator. <laughs> it happened a little bit more securitously than that. Um, for me, uh, I started as psychobiology as an undergraduate and thought I wanted to go into neuroscience. Um, and I did my undergraduate work at Wellesley and then cross registering at MIT in cognitive neuroscience. My last year of college, I went to Berkeley for the last year um, and took a graduate course in neuroanatomy. Um, and I was, even with the coloring book that Marion Diamond taught this, I don't know if any of you are familiar with her, but she's very famous in the field. Uh, and I was just struggling um, to figure out all those cross sections, sagittal sections, and she a lot of memorization. And so she suggested, she said, why don't you go up to the Lawrence Hall of Science, where they teach about um, the brain. And right now they're developing an exhibit, a curriculum, an outreach program for kids, and you might find it's another way of thinking about the brain that you might be able to access some of these, you know, these sections better. And they have models of the brain and so forth. You can you know, kind of play with. So, um, so I did that and I ended up taking a job there for a year and I got so immersed into the experience of outreach um, where I would drive out in a van and we had this enormous stuffed brain on the um, stage for middle school students and I had to wear this um, kind of multicolored tracksuit that had um, the nervous system on it. 
And once you do something like that and you get a positive reaction from kids, it just kind of changes, you know, the way that you, you think about um, things. So I, um, from that experience, I was fascinated why, um, how people make sense and meaning of science um, in informal ways. Um, and little did I know there was this field called informal science education. And that there is a, an organization like the National Science Foundation that actually funds projects like this. Um, so I got interested in really, um, you know, rather than going a laboratory route, I decided to go um, more into evaluation and research around informal science and education learning. Um, so I went to the um, graduate school and Barbara Flagg, who you see pictured in the middle there, was a professor at Harvard Graduate School. Somebody on this call is, I think, a student there, right? Uh, so anyway, um, and I actually never ended up taking a class with her, but she became a mentor for me early in my career. Um, she's written a couple of the chapters in the, um, the IC Frameworks book that you shared last week. Um, she taught a lot um, and really has done a lot of formative and front end kind of evaluation work for a lot of different media projects. So when I was younger in my career and having children and wanting more flexibility and working from home and all that, um, I worked kind of with her, a few others as well. And then, um, you know, this field is such that uh, it, it, it's fairly niche oriented. Um, I particularly have worked with, as along with Barbara, um, in different kinds of media. So um, television documentaries, websites, games online, um, IMAX films and so forth. So it's, um, your work starts to, especially since 2013, when you saw the um, informal science.org really kind of take hold. Before that, you would write, you were required to do evaluation as part of NSF funded projects, but you, um, the reports just would go to the producers, go to NSF, the program office would write off on it. That was kind of the end of it. And then the decision was made within NSF that this really is knowledge that should be shared and people should be building on this work. So informal science.org sort of came from that, from the spirit of that. Um, and CASE is funded, just like everybody else, um, you know, to do that work. And so they have to periodically get reviewed as well and, um, you know, update their, their agenda and mission and so forth. So um, that, that's kind of how I got into it. Um, everybody else here, Devon is my co-director co with me. He, you know, went to Harvard Law School, um, worked as attorney in New York City, um, loves nature documentaries, loves nature, um, and again, kind of migrated to this area. He does statistical work. He loves math, economics, and so forth, um, contracting, that kind of thing. Um, Rachel went to Yale School of Pharmacy Forestry, uh, decided to actually work more kind of in outreach. Um, and I met her on a project um, called The Shape of Life um, years ago um, as an outreach coordinator. Um, and she's just got fast with evaluation. So we kind of connected that way. Uh, Lisa Santiago, she is now actually, just as of this last few months, a program officer of the National Science Foundation. So she's someone who's well worth getting to know. She's just a, a lovely human being. We've worked for years together on projects. Um, many of them are side growth projects, and I'll mention a little bit about that as part of our um, example. And others are ones who've kind of grown up through the ranks, I guess. Um, Gabe and Kia both are very into computer science. They are into social media metrics, analytics, that kind of thing. And they can kind of liaison with a lot of the producers we work with on how to make sense of those kinds of numbers for projects that have like online components and so forth. And because so many of our projects have families and youth as a focus of the projects, um, we always have youth advisors who you know, constantly are looking at the goals of projects, looking at the kinds of measures we put together, giving input. Um, kind of throughout the process of, of our work. So that sort of gives you an example of, um, you know, who, who's working on our projects. So um, I mentioned that this is a couple things we'll do today. We're kind of gonna walk through a recent evaluation project and do the survey question exercise to kind of give you some feedback on just some basic questions that you might have. So um, the, the project that I chose to focus on is the one at the bottom here. Um, and one of the things that we've um, migrated to in recent years is really looking at the use of narrative. And I chose that for this project, partly because, Fanuel, you have a lot of work on narrative actually in your organization that thought it would be of interest. Um, and a lot of the media projects we work on, whether the producers intentionally know it or not, um, they, have, they have narrative as part of their um, format. And really very little work has been done on this in informal science education. A lot in the health, um, NIH funds a lot of projects that look at use of narrative. 
um, but not so much um, in formal science education. So we've, in the last few years, sort of taken it upon ourselves, even if it wasn't part of the original grant um, that we wrote with these producers, um, we've, we started taking a look at the value of it. Here's just three projects um, that happen to have uh, a narrative focus and the questions that we asked are included in there. The middle one, code side growth, is one that we are actually just working on now. So we are just developing measures. The media are all produced, but we're just in the point of um, developing measures and trying to figure out how to do it in a COVID environment as well with kids not in schools and, and so forth. All right. so. Just to give you a sense of um, what do we mean by narrative. So essentially what we're focusing on is where you have a kind of a three act structure. So um, identify by the beginning, middle and end, and you have character setting conflicts. You kind of have the set up to confrontation to resolution. So um, again, if you look at any of our reports, you'll see we have you know, quite a bit more detail about where that comes from, but that's kind of the idea of what we're looking for in terms of whether a media meets that kind of criteria. Here are, um, just to give you an example of the kinds of projects that are out there. So this one is an online game. Um, Lawrence Hall Science actually produced it. It was fun for me 20 some years later to you know, work with them again. Um, and so there's, here's two games, both um, basically are about the main character trying to understand what's happening with symptoms that they're having and trying to figure out, figure out, figure out a medical basis for it. One is you are the character and I got this, the other is Pragar, uh, a monster who you get to follow along in his journey. This one, just, just in case you haven't heard about it yet, SIPA, have you talked about the SIPA program? We have not. Okay, very well worth knowing about. Um, for those of you looking to, to get grants, um, it's, it's a, actually a science education you know, division of, of the NIH. Um, the grants are um, smaller than what NSF will provide, by $250,000 a year maximum. They provide a lot more grants for five years, oftentimes in length. Um, but they're, you know, so I think the entry is is easier in some ways. Um, they do really like career focuses in their program. So something like both of these, um, and we, we're in fact we're working on one right now, three by edu, um, which is about the brain. But again, so it's about teaching kids about the brain, but also about going into neuroscience as a career. So it's just been a fun one for me as well. Um, so yeah. If you, Bookmark that if that's sort of new to you. Side growth. Has um, anybody heard of side growth before? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so side growth. Know. Many of you have interest in middle school students. Um, I saw on your projects, and um, whether boys or girls, um, this is this is well worth knowing about. Um, TPT, Twin Cities Public Television in Minneapolis, St. Paul, um, Minnesota. Um, they have for years been funding. Um, different kinds of side growth programs. So it typically it's a combination of what you see on the left and the right top um, are episodes. These are 30 minute episodes and you have a mentor, a scientist. Um, so here's somebody who's a coding professional um, walking girls through a project um, and they follow a storyline and it kind of follows the, the problem they're working on, the resolution of it. And in the process, you learn about the mentor and her career. They also have three to five minute um, real model profile videos, in which case you're learning about a specific um, here, like a coding professional, um, her background, her personal background, her, her job, the barriers to entry um, kind of follows the formula there, but kind of tells her story in three to five minutes. And in this particular case, there's also a game. And the game um, is um, again, something that we're looking at now in terms of having a narrative kind of focus to it. Um, how does that work in terms of girls learning coding and having an interest in coding careers and so forth. Um, next one. So this takes us to Amazon Adventure. Um, has anybody seen this film by any chance? No? Okay. So this is an IMAX film um, produced by SK Films and the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, funded by the National Science Foundation. Um, and here's a little quote by the producer and writer, Wendy. Um, and you can see kind of in there just from her perspective, the value of storytelling with science. Um, she was kind of a treasure to work with because she very much values um, honoring the, kind of the, the narrative format and um, the way that it's helpful for us to be able to actually evaluate. But it's actually um, somewhat unusual. There's about three IMAX films that have been funded so far by the National Science Foundation. And between Barbara and I, we've worked on almost all of them, <laughs> maybe at least 20 of them in one form or another. Um, but 
couple of those, only four have actually followed a continuous storyline. Um, these are the other three, Flight of the Butterflies was also um, produced by Wendy as well. Just to give you a little bit of a sense of the film, um, Henry Bates, you've probably heard of, right? Um, so this story, and I don't know if you know how long an IMAX film is, giant screen film, but about 40 minutes. So in 40 minutes, they're telling the story of his 11 year journey through the rainforest, right? The Amazon rainforest. Um, there's a website. I've got the link down there below if you want this later, um, where you can learn more about the making of the film and the different parts of it. But just to give you a feeling for what did we do on this project? So as you can see, we were pretty busy there. This starts in 2016, goes to 2019, and we're actually still doing some work on it. Um, but you wanna go back even two years before that because we had to help them write the grant to get, to get funded, right? So as part of that, um, we typically, you know, grant um, awards are due in Penal in November or January, depending on the year, right? And we may get a call anytime from um, May, August, November, or January to help on a project. Um, preferably we prefer earlier, but that doesn't always happen. Um, in this case, we had a pretty good amount of time. And the producers will give us a treatment of what they're kind of you know, envisioning the film will be um, like. It gives you a sense of narration, a sense of the story. Um, they'll give you their goals. They had better give you a logic model, right? Because we would, that's really, if nothing else, that would be helpful to us to understand kind of what you're after, a map of kind of the project. Um, so we did that, and, it, and then a couple of years later is usually when you're starting to work on it. So it's a long process. Um, so think about that from 2014 to roughly now, um, to how long it can take to actually do a project with NSF from beginning to end. But here you'll see, um, and I think that you've learned some of these terms, or if you didn't already know them, around front end, formative, um, implementation, some evaluation. Those are those are terms that are familiar, pretty much, or pretty intuitive. Okay. Um, all again, there's ways to find out about all of those more. But as you can see, the idea was that we did some work, um, not just with the public, and I'll tell you a bit more about who their audience was in a minute, but. Um, we also worked with educators as well, and some of you are interested in doing that as well. So not just working with students, but also educators and families and so forth. Um, we did a presentation on our findings in 2018, and then the summer evaluation is a report that we that I'm going to be talking to you about how we how we kind of went about that. So those are the, those are kind of the components, and so there's a fair amount. Sometimes on projects we're only working on the front end. Sometimes we're only working on formative. Sometimes we're doing front end and summative. So it kind of depends on the project and what the, the you know what the needs are. But typically NSF requires that all of those components are um, somehow or other included. Here's the kinds of questions that we ask to help kind of um, figure out what our work is going to be. And I can't tell you how many times we are asked to develop an evaluation plan when we haven't seen anything about a project. We don't even know if it's a film or it's a website or what, we don't know what it is. It's just, I never quite understand that, that it would seem to me that a project would drive the evaluation, <laughs> but you'd be surprised. Um, so anyway, we try to use some very, um, and again, we're often working with media producers who are very creative. Um, they don't really like having to always fit into these logic model kinds of um, requirements and having to think about their projects in some of these ways. So that's where you know our job is to try to help kind of make that um, not so painful <laughs> um, and maybe even enjoyable, right? Um, these are the kind of questions that we asked. In this case, for, for Amazon Adventure, we did all front-end formative and summative evaluation for it, right? Who's the audience? So the audience in this case, if you look at who goes to see giant screen films, IMAX films, they're in science center theaters, they're in commercial theaters, um, typically it's families. Middle school is a huge group because they go on field trips. Um, what will the audience experience? Well, we know it's kind of a confined experience in a um, theater, right, for 40 minutes or so. There may or may not be some things related. They might go out into the out of the theater and they'll find a kiosk there, something where they could um, interact with um, a rainforest exhibit. Um, there might be space programs. There might be a website that has more videos and so forth. So lots of different, you know, aspects to what they might experience. Uh, where is in the theater, obviously, as well as continuation other places. Um, we'll ask about how will it be implemented. So again, you know, do they have any expectation that this would be families or single viewing or couples or, you know, what around that? Um, 
And again, people who work in the giant screen industry, they have that pretty nailed down. They have very good metrics and um, on um, who goes to see the films. They work with the theater distributors and so they have a, a good sense of that. Um, and then the win is pretty obvious. You know, it's when you go to the theater to have the experience and the why is the part about looking at, you know, what do you really expect to happen as a result of watching a 40 minute film? Okay, what's realistic about that? Um, and a lot of times there's very grand expectations around, well, you know, if a kid sees this, it's so immersive and so um, an intense experience that you're gonna change your some identity and wanna become scientists. Well, okay, maybe in sometimes you can have a very short um, experience that can be very powerful and it can lead you, you know, into um, some possible direction. But, but uh, what do you really want us to measure to be able to say to the NSF that was a realistic outcome? Those are the kind of conversations that we have. Now, this is hilarious in a way, but I went to the proposal to look for the logic model and there wasn't one. <laughs> and I said, uh-oh, this is gonna be a problem because this is, this is you know, very much part of what SAI does, right? Um, but for extra credit, if anybody wants to take, this is a logic model template that I really like. Uh, we did this for the Discover Health Project, another NIH project. Um, I, I really like this project logic model and then it's focusing on audiences. And what I find is a lot of times um, clients you work with, they, they kind of forget who the audience is and they, and they kind of forget, like they have an outcome of maybe um, like the STEM identity, but they apply that to everybody. So the, the parents, the kids, the educators, like, well, let's really think about who you're applying the outcomes to. So the more that you can kind of be specific um, about, you know, the outcomes. In this case, this was library patrons and they were coming to see an exhibit. There was programming, a variety of things happening for them as well. But I just share this in case it's a template that somebody wants to use and, and, and point out the importance of why we really should have had that um, in this proposal. But um, again, at the time that this was happening, it may not have been a requirement in any stuff. So, um, but we did um, have to develop some learning categories. So clearly because it's funded by the NSF, it's got to have some science learning component, right? And so here we have um, some questions around Bates, his scientific quest. So could they define it? Um, think he achieved it. What methods did he use in his quest? Mimicry, could people define it and give examples? Species change, whether they thought some species changed over time, um, whether one can change to another, the role of predators and species survival. So we had some questions around that as well. Narrative engagement, and I'll get into this in a bit more detail, but um, you know, here we're talking about both story, the engagement of the story and characters. So those can be related, but they can also be separate. So we look at that. Because it's a giant screen film and it's in these enormous five-story buildings, um, you I can imagine a sense of emergent presence that happens if you feel you are there. And so there's some scales that have actually been developed um, to measure that, whether people feel that sense and to look at how that might relate to their learning and from the experience. We have questions about that and some demographic background questions. Now, when it came to what method would we use to um, evaluate those kinds of outcomes, right? So lots of options, and we don't have time to go into all of the options, um, but these are some that we looked at, thought about, um, and the ones in bold are the ones that we ended up actually going with on this project. So just to give you a little bit more feeling about the um, narrative structure and how we thought about that in terms of Henry Bates' story, here we have in the first act of the film, his early life, he's traveling to South America, collecting butterflies and so forth. Right, he has a lot of um, challenges, a lot of barriers, poor health, um, not collecting what he's hoping to collect, having to go back to England without reaching his goal. And then finally he returns and he has the butterfly samples that he hoped to discover, right? That's the basics of it. So underlying that narrative impact. So again, when you thought about the questions that you wrote, so we could simply say, did you engage with the narrative, right? So what would that mean to people? It's pretty loaded, right? And what you hope to find if you have the time to be able to measure something more than just a one-shot question is start to look at the dimensions of that. So what does narrative impact mean? And it turns out there's a fair amount of research that we could build on in terms of understanding um, engagement, both with the story and with the character. So that's how we tied it to this here. Um, and here are some dimensions of that. So when you look at people engaging with the story, um, we look at the extent to which the story appeals to them, the extent to which the audience becomes transported into the story world, and that has cognitive and affective dimensions. 
to write or just some examples of um, actual quotes people gave in their open-ended response um, to our questions, right? So it just gives you a feel for how those kind of play out. Um, engagement with character. So again, people are evaluating the characters in terms of, do they find it appealing? Do they find the characters similar to them? Something they can kind of relate to. Can they identify with the characters? So these, again, have dimensions to them in terms of empathic, cognitive, and motivational. Um, all of these, uh, you know, I'm throwing a fair amount out there, but all of this is kind of detailed in the report, um, which you can look at to get a sense of how we put that together. So we came up with the questions. We, um, you, you know, you have to keep in mind, we have a 40 minute film. Um, we have to figure out how to do that fairly efficiently. Um, we come up with a plan and once that plan is sort of figured out, the producers agree with it, um, we then have to have an IRB review it. Um, and the IRB is gonna look at it from the point of view is, is this generalizable research? Um, you know, is it exempt? Um, you need to have a full review. And in this case, you know, when you have a, a project that's kind of following typical educational practices, um, and you can show them your consent forms and so forth. You can, you know, we were exempt in this particular case, but I share with you, ENI is a fee-based um, private IRB um, company that many, um, many of the projects that we work on go through. If, if we're not with a university partner where they have their own IRB, you know, that, that's one that, you know, you'll charge um, you know, anywhere between you do a conceptual overview first, maybe $400 just for them to say, yes, it looks like it should be, you know, approvable, and then you have to go through the exemption process and so forth. That's probably another $800. So there's something you got to budget for if it's something you need to do as part of an NSF project, right? Informal Science has some nice um, blogs about IRBs. So I just throw in some um, ideas there for searching those out to see what you might find, um, to give you a little bit more information about what we're talking about. Then it came time for us to do our evaluation. Um, and so we picked, um, these were four science centers um, that are partners to the project. And here is the one that I'm gonna show you about today. Does anybody know where that is? Palm trees, gives you a little bit of a clue, <laughs> Florida. Um, all right, so this is the Bank of uh, America Visitor Pavilion. So try to imagine this now. One of the things I think is so important is, um, just keeping in mind your audience, your audience is real people, and the real people are typically, like in this case, families with kids going to a theater, right? Um, and it's it sounds simple, but it, I've noticed people often start to forget that you know these are subjects they are exposed to a treatment. Um, this is an experience that people are having on their own. In this case, they're coming to this theater to watch this film, right? Um, while they're at the theater, um, they might see these. Uh, there are examples of what's going on in the science center. So the film may just be one part of their day. They might have paid a ticket to do many other things, including the butterfly exhibit. All of these are going to be part of their experience too that could be related to or not necessarily related to the film. Here, um, it's not sure anybody's lined up, but here's you know, what we have to look at in terms of where people are going to see the film, right? So they're going to line up here and they're going to go into the theater. They're going to sit down, they're going to look up, they're going to see a big screen, and then the movie's going to start. So after that, um, this just gives you a sense again, walking it through in terms of the, vis the view, you know, the kind of visitor, the viewer's experience with this film, right? And our job then is to figure out how do we um, how do we capture feedback on this um, happening in real time. Uh, so here is a separate sample design that is very often used with giant screen film because it's something you can actually do where um, people who line up to see the film, you're gonna have a couple of different groups. There's those who are gonna go on and see the film and there's those who are gonna complete a pre-survey for you. They are in effect are your control group and you ask them a set of demographic questions. You can ask them a set of knowledge questions. So all those things we talked about in terms of mimicry and species change and basic quests, um, they can answer some questions about that because they haven't seen the film yet. Um, then people go and see the film and the group who hasn't done a pre-survey they complete a pro-survey for us, right? And then some of them um, also did interviews and then we did a follow-up survey three to four weeks later. That just gives you a sense of the design that we had. So I'm gonna just share a, just a short clip from the film just to give you a feel for it because you're gonna then answer a very short set of questions around narrative engagement. So I know you haven't seen the film, but just give you enough of a sense um, 
and just see what it would be like to have that experience and then answer some questions about it, okay? See if you can hear it, okay. Barry, there's no audio at the moment. Can you hear it? Uh, no audio at the moment. Okay, let me try it again. Hidden over here, right? How's that? Can you hear it? Uh, I'm still waiting. Nothing yet. You can't hear it? Yeah, nothing yet. Nope. Okay. Let's see. I can hear it loud and clear. Um, yeah, I think in the maybe in the Zoom settings, you have to sort of project it to us. I think it's okay. Yeah. Well, let's see. I don't want to waste time on not being able to have that happen for you. Um, sorry about that. We do so much work in teams that it just. Yeah. So try on click on share on Zoom, like the share button, and then share computer sound. Okay. So. Do you see the the. Uh... Mm, no. No. Okay. So, Let's see. Hmm. Yeah, maybe we can just keep moving for now. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. All right. Um, let me just try to make sure we can go to the next one. Oh, dear. I think I got it frozen here. Let's see if I can make sure I get back to my screen. Okay. Does anybody have any questions while I try to just get this back to where we at least were? Yeah, feel free to drop in the chat or just ask away. Um, yeah, I'm well. sorry. This is. Um, Is there any reason why you don't have people who did the pre-survey answer questions after also to see if they have any change in attitude or view after seeing the film? Yeah, um, that's a good question. And the reason is that you're, if you're asking people a minute or two or three, which is as long as you have, the film and really sensitizing them to the content of the film, the cases where we'll do work with middle school students um, and they'll go on a field trip. So if we can ask those questions a week before they go and maybe mix them with some other questions where we're not doing so much sensitizing to what's going on in the film content, then yeah. Um, but that's that's one reason why this is, um, and if you get enough numbers of people, um, you know, this, this process works pretty well. So um, yeah, so good question. And there's um, some footnotes in our report about that, exactly why you would pick this type of procedure for this type of um, film. Okay. Yeah, the, the idea of having some sort of control group is like a control point, a baseline or something, right? To see mm -hmm. the change. Um, and of course, as we all know, the RCT is kind of the, the gold standard, but uh, this, that, that usually is out of reach for most people <laughs> to do that. So you have to go the pseudo, pseudo method. Right, and we have other examples of um, where we've been able to do that. Um, but, so we're gonna skip past that. So assuming you had that experience and it's worth, um, you know, you can, this, you can find that clip and others on the Amazon Adventure website. Um, these are the questions that um, people were asked to rate in terms of their engagement with the narrative. Okay, so you see these are around the story, right? That they like the story, they moved to the film, they want to discover how Bates went about its work and so forth. So that was an experience I wanted you to have, but um, we won't have time for it. Um, and then the same thing goes to um, the character engagement, the extent to which they engage with Henry Bates as a character. So once we looked at what happened with, we, again, we had over 400 people um, between those who did the pre and those who did the post-survey experience. 
So we look at what we find here in terms of overall people were um, very engaged um, with both the character and the story, leading to a pretty high um, overall mean rating. The, um, just to give you a sense for how those same questions um, map out in terms of the three act story narrative, you can kind of see here's the statements down here with cognitive and effective. So some relate to the entire story, some relate to different acts within the narrative structure. In terms of the um, learning, some science learning overall, so the light blue shows you the previewers, the dark blue, the, um, the viewers, there was a significant difference between learning scores. Looking at it by the area, these were the questions about Bates' question. You can see people who had not yet seen the film really did not know much about or anything about his quest, let alone that he had a quest. Right? Um, in terms of mimicry, again, a difference in terms of the ability to define mimicry. Um, quite a bit afterwards, the species stage. People came in knowing a little bit more about that than we might've thought. So that wasn't quite as big a difference as you might've expected. So then um, that's kind of where the evaluation ends. Um, we were not, you know, every evaluation is um, tied also to uh, funding um, and what you're funded to do and what you've been approved to do. Um, looking at the actual relationships between narrative engagement and science learning is something that we're um, going back and looking at now as we're preparing to um, uh, do work on SciGirls Code, the, the project I talked about. Um, so stay tuned again, we're, we're looking at really trying to refine those measures so that we could have these applied um, to many other projects for families and youth as well. All right, so let's switch now to um, the survey question that. Um, but the thing to take a look at is, um, is the question something that's going to give you information appropriate for what your purpose is, right? Does it address the outcome that you chose? Is it appropriate for your audience in terms of level, readability, and so forth? Is it specific, direct, free of jargon, leading, asking two questions in one? Or is it a big idea that needs to be broken down into multiple questions? And that's the example of the narrative engagement I wanted to share because Often you'll find people will ask very loaded, big questions, um, but there may be a lot more to it. And you don't always have the time and space and money and so forth to um, ask those nuanced dimensions, but it's worth looking at how others have done it because there's often more to it than just a big open-ended question. So if we look at, let's see if this works. Um, here's the questions that people completed. Okay, can you see that? Okay. Um, I think it, it launched on a different screen, so you'll have to switch uh, screens and go to the browser so, you can, so that we can see it. Okay, so I'm it's still loading, I think. Yeah. Can you see it now? Uh, nope. Not yet. If, can you pull up your, everybody should have it, right? You have a yeah. second, if you have a second screen or a second tab, pull up, pull up the questions that you worked on. Yeah, and, and I'm happy to share my screen if that's easier, uh, Valerie. Yeah, or sure. Not. So, yeah, I was like, okay, let me, let me just do it from my screen here. Can you see that? Yes, I can okay. see. Can other people see it? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. So why don't we just take a look at some of these survey questions and thinking about the list that we just went through in terms of leading or asking two questions or jargon um, or multi-dimensional. Um, let's just. Yeah, let's just take a look at um, a few of these and see if people can find ways to give feedback or suggestions for how it might be refined um, based on what we see before in terms of the audience, the outcome, and also the kinds of responses that um, are more anticipated. Does anybody have any thoughts about that first one? I think it's very specific. 
<laughs> you know, it's like almost a binary yes, no. Um, well, okay, so and there's a, there's a question. So, for example, Jackie, is that something where you would hope that um, you might have some initial yes, no, not sure, right? And then from there, maybe branching to um, why a little more explanation. Um, or did you intend that to be just a very open-ended kind of exploratory question, right? In which case you might not use the do you, you might use um, you know, something a little bit more softer. Yeah, this one is definitely very specific, almost maybe too specific. Like you said, it just kind of curtails it with like a, that's a, it is very much a yes or no question. Okay. Um, but yeah, as far as trying to make it look for responses about somebody's experience in the real world with as a result of the engagement with this uh, game guide thing. Um, hmm. <laughs> I, maybe well, I do, do you, mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, do you, do you care about the intentionality? I mean, is, is, is the beginning piece of this just to, they stop to look because sometimes it's, Again, is that asking a couple of things there for people? Is it is it easier for them to hang on to? Do they stop to look at at microhabitat, and do they know what you mean by that? So, um, you know, that's again your audience. If your audience is seventh, twelfth grade, yeah, the older they are, they may understand what microhabitats are. But maybe again, the more that you can be really specific about what you're looking for, um, and you mm -hmm. kind of build it from there. For sure. Yeah. All right. Let's let's look at the um, next one. This one's for teachers, right? Can students identify, can your students identify problems in their community and seek solutions through the use of the scientific method of public policy practice? So does anybody see something there in terms of those kinds of questions we just asked? Something that could be maybe improved a little bit? So the, right off the top, I would look at it's asking two questions, right? And that is, that is probably the biggest, um, yeah, easy mistake to make, I think. Um, every question should just ask one question. Every statement should be one statement. So it's otherwise you're going to find people are gonna latch on to comment on one part of the question, not another part. Um, can get confusing, very confusing in terms of an, an, analyzing responses. Um, but that's nice that you got some sample responses there in terms of the kinds of things that you're already thinking through. And that's another thing we find is people often when they ask questions, they really don't have any clue what to expect the answers might look like, what the range of answers might look like. Um, so that's great to see that there's already some sort of thought about uh, what, you know, what that, what that would might look like. Um, okay, so that would be, that would be a place to start there is separate those two into two questions actually. Um, and again, making sure when you use words like scientific method, public policy practices, do you feel your audience is going to understand what you're getting at? You know, is there a simple way to say it, or maybe for educators, it's just fine. Um, okay, so the next one: What factors would prevent you from signing up for a four-week online storytelling storytelling training program? Anything there? We'll make the assumption that people will know what the online story training program is, right? So they'll know a little bit about it um, before they're making a decision about whether or not, um, you know, you know, perhaps one suggestion there would be, um, well, would they consider signing up for a four-week online storytelling program before you make the assumption um, that there's a negative um, or a positive? Just find out if they actually would consider it. And if so, why? And if not, why not? Um, that why not will lead you into some of the ideas about factors that might be preventing them from going. So that might be an example. So it's, it's not really a leading question, but it's sort of giving it a negative frame, I guess, that may not be needed um, right off the top. All right, the next one, Robbins. Um, how confident do you feel? Sorry? Uh, I have a question about, this is maybe a good example for like, when, when I've tried to design surveys previously, there tend to be like two tracks, right? And so like in this last example, somebody could be like open to a storytelling tr program or not open. And you wanna follow up with both of those questions, but then your survey becomes this dichotomous key of like, you know, it could go on for pages and pages 
if it was like a physically printed form. And mm -hmm. I wonder if there are like structural decisions that you end up making to keep it short or to like reduce the redundancy of just like, whoa, half of half of this survey is like available, but never gets seen, but it looks really intimidating if you were to try to like pass it out in a physical format. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, and I think that's an example where, and again, online branching was, you know, Survey Monkey or Qualtrics, whatever, you, those kinds of systems make it really easy because it's not even visible, right, to you as a, as a, as a survey taker. Um, so then you just have to get really prioritizing, you know, who your audience is and what's um, really, you know, the more that you know about them, you're going to hopefully segment and target that as specifically as possible so that they don't have to go through that experience and there's your kind of, you know, there's another slide I have about piloting is really important. Um, you know, it's, you know, for like some of our projects, we actually have a decent number of funds um, to actually pilot, you know, with our um, with the students or teachers, whoever it is. Um, and if you don't, even beyond yourself, you know, friends, colleagues, um, family members and so forth, can give you really good insight into ways to just be as tailored as possible. So that you're not, you know, picking people, making them work extra hard and asking them really the most relevant questions um, for what you are looking to find out. And sometimes if it's so branch like that, maybe the survey is not the right way to do it. You know, there's a lot of other methods. Maybe you're looking for something that's either more exploratory, more open, like some of those other methods we had or an interview, for example, where you can do that one-on-one um, -on -one maybe, but so maybe kind of reconsider your method choice as well. Um, okay, so we're down to the confidence questions. How confident do you feel writing questions to ask a scientist? Okay, does anybody see any areas for kind of tweaking that a little bit? Well, it seems like from the the anticipated answers that it looks like a Likert type scale would probably be provided with it. But if there wasn't a like options provided with it, um, maybe rephrasing to be a little bit more specific with the types of responses that they want about how confident someone feels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, um, for example, with the Code Side Girls project we're talking about right now, what we're looking at is measures around confidence, girls' confidence in coding as a result of playing an hour game or watching these episodes with um, mentors showing coding. Um, so we've just, um, Robin, if you wanted to email me, um, I could share with you some Likert scares that do specifically look at confidence um, with elementary and upper middle school um, kids as well. Um, Cause exactly right. You know, you would probably, unless you really want to, to elaborate on that and maybe you do in any case, but you'd want to give them a very simple scale that, you know, runs something, you know, maybe one to five scale that, um, you know, from very confident to not at all confident. Um, and then from there, you'd want to find out why, right? And again, the other thing is to make sure they understand what you mean about um, writing questions to ask a scientist. You, is that just in general? Or is it about their career? Is it about their barriers? Is it about what got them into it? I mean, sometimes that can make a difference to context. You know, what is it? The, what are the questions about? Um, could, could make a difference in terms of otherwise you might get a very global response that's, um, you know, helpful yes. or not helpful. A question for, for you. Um, so the like, Likert scale in particular, what are your thoughts about the neutral response, the middle frame? And to some two camps, some people like it there to give people that middle ground. And then some are saying, you know, we want to force the user to give us a response. It, yeah, it really depends. I mean, that, you know, times that we, we do use it more often than not, um, but it does depend on the context. It, mm. it, it's times when, and, and then, you know, but you can also do things with your analysis where you can um, include or not. Um, so yeah, good question. Um, and if you want more resources on the different schools of camp, um, so we typically use it more often than not, but it also depends on whether you really want to get a forced, you know, choice on it. Um, so level, please indicate the level of knowledge the website provides you. So any, any suggestions there? Looks like um, the idea here was to, to tag it to the framework, right? Or at least the, the responses to the framework. So um, awareness, conceptual understanding. Um, so again, that one I find um, 
maybe it could be written a little more direct. So what do you really want people to tell you that, that, um, that they're learning from the website and providing them um, information? Um, because the idea is you want to them to learn about chemistry, right? These are chemistry students. So you're hoping that the, the website will increase their knowledge about chemistry resources, right? Maybe kind of start back. I think I do a little bit more work on that outcome there. Um, if you're desirous to build increased knowledge in chemistry, the hope is that the website will provide them with resources. This might be one where you, it's a little broad and you want to look at the dimensions of it. So it's around maybe it's, um, you know, um, how, in, how, um, how useful do they find the resources around chemistry? Um, you know, was the information, you know, too dense, just right, you know, too little, that there's, there's some aspects to it, to kind of go a little deeper on your outcomes there that given that you're talking about chemistry students, you could probably um, more fully. And then I, again, I had to look a little bit more at that framework in terms of what you're thinking there as far as um, it, that one experience of being on the website, really making that much of a difference in terms of those levels. So I'm not, yeah. I have to look at that. And uh, to, to Jackie added, you know, maybe parse this out further, you know, um, into certain areas, processes, chemical formulas, et cetera. And, and the point here, again, is the specificity. And I think you've been hearing <laughs> us throughout this program so far mention that focus, specificity, it, it, it goes through the different levels you know, in your question, in what you're actually assessing, right, in, how, in your approach. Um, it's really important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. Nice. Um, okay, so what about your best guess of what a civil engineer does? Yeah, it's my own and to criticize it a little bit, I guess, open ended questions. Sometimes people skip answering them or they could use prompts, but I would be really interested to just kind of get like a brainstorm at the start mm -hmm. of a survey. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now do you feel like the this is middle high school? Um, undergraduates, right? Do you, do you feel that saying best guess is framing the question a little bit more than is useful um, in terms of does that imply that they really don't know, they shouldn't know, or this is like a big ask of them um, versus something a little more direct about, um, you know, describe what is, you know, what a civil engineer does, something like that, something that just, um, yeah, like the best guess like more precise language so it doesn't seem like, um, you know, I don't want to discourage anyone who definitely knows what it is or any, like just kind of. Right. Or make an assumption that you, that they aren't going to know, that they'd have to guess, right? Right, that, um, right. Yeah. Maybe could um, add a sentence if you're not sure, take your best guess, something like mm -hmm. that. Give it, give it the, but yeah, yeah, you're not being tested, you're not being graded. There's, there's ways you can frame things like that so people don't feel like they're being intimidated. You're Thank just you. Looking to, and maybe also the reasons why you're asking because you're trying to understand how to, um, um, how to, you know, how to educate um, students about, you know, what a, what a, what a, chemist, or, what a chemist or a civil engineer does. Um, and I had, I'm sorry, earlier because I had so many technical problems, I'm sorry, I had um, some projects for people to look at based on theirs. And one that you might want to look at is um, Project Dream Big. There's an NSF funded project called Dream Big. Have you heard of that? Um, and it's an yes. IMAX film, but it has, yeah, okay. They have lots of, and again, evaluation there as well. They did not get funded by the NSF actually. Surprisingly, um, we were actually on that grant too, but they went ahead and did it anyway. So they have a lot of great outreach and a lot of good resources that might be of help. And there's others too. There's others. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, how about the design one? Um, well, other than the fact that we have two questions, right? Which is that's okay, because you're we could just put them on different places. Um, any thoughts there on that one? So this was mine and um, I will say I am definitely one of those people that if you give me a survey with an open box, I will not fill it. So um, I think that my thinking was that I would provide like um, multiple options, like it's funny, it's interesting, it looks cool and just like they can just hit the buttons for as many as apply. Okay, well, maybe you can start off with would you share your design, okay, assuming that they know what that is, right, with, with a friend. Yeah, the, the whole workshop will be about that, so they will know. Okay. This is more like um, as they're coming out, 
of the but that, that yeah it's a nice question because it's it's really a behavioral attention kind of question you know you're trying to get a sense of versus just liking it or not sharing it is indicating that they actually would do something with it so maybe you could have yes no and then the question is then a follow-up you know as to why not or why would you um and anything else that you feel falls from that same thing with um what they will like about it um maybe what they wouldn't like about it so that's definitely on the right track yeah, I think maybe I will change it so that um, it wouldn't be like a no and then the second one doesn't apply at all, but just like, who would you share this with? Mm -hmm. And my hope is that it will be a peer, but you know, if it's their mom, that's cool too. Yeah, and you could, you know, if you wanted, if you felt like you had a kind of idea of the universe of people that it might be, you could just make it easy on them and put those people down, mother or family member, friend, colleague, whatever else, um, other, you know, just to from there, again, makes your analysis a little bit easier than trying to always interpret what people are talking about. Um, when they say something like Susan, you know, or <laughs> you know who that is. Um, but yeah, that's, that sounds like, that sounds great. Um, and again, I had a couple projects that I, were related to your project that I'll, I'll send those later. Um, what are your views about scientific inquiry? Do you think that scientific investigation can follow more than one method? And we're middle school science teachers. Okay, so any thoughts on this one? I feel like your views about scientific inquiry is like a huge topic. Like I wouldn't even know where to start. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, let's go back, back a column to the outcome. So the idea is increased knowledge, understanding of scientific inquiry, right? So these are middle school science teachers. Um, so would you, so instead of your views, is it more about their knowledge of scientific inquiry? Um, is that is that more no single set, a sequence of steps following all of the investigation? So it sounds like it is more knowledge. Um, is the is the, the goal to not so much opinions, right? About about it, scientific inquiry. Um, yeah, not when I think. Go ahead. Yeah, there, there are some components uh, times where you can independently assess the knowledge gains, right? And and also you know, for here we're looking at almost like self you know, so that self-efficacy, right, towards these things. Uh, sometimes for students, you can look at their grades. I know some programs might do that, where they look at their grades independently to say, okay, I've done this in incursion, this experience. How has it changed their performance, right, in this test, mm -hmm. independent test, which is an interesting way. And I can imagine for teachers as well, uh, I guess, Afikia, you can do um, the knowledge gains, right? Um, if there's some test, I don't know, some independent measurement yeah, you could um, do. Yeah, this is my um, my question. Um, basically, there is a discussion between um, the knowledge and understanding and the views because you can't really, um, they say, um, you can't measure the knowledge and understanding of scientific inquiry, but rather you can measure the views or perception or something like that, or belief. Um, that's what that's what I gather from from the research article anyway. Um, so the question is basically whether they understand or not about scientific inquiry. So that's why the general 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 discussion is that the the views of scientific inquiry and there are quite underlying question, so like multiple level question. Mm -hmm. So maybe you want to start because it sounds like understanding is kind of what you're after first is do they understand um, what scientific inquiry is, right? Um, or maybe, you know, it's not just ask them self-report about it, but actually what do they, what do they define it to be? Uh, what do they know it to be? Something like that. Um, there are, and one of my last slides shows some, um, you know, there's been a fair amount of work on this, as you mentioned in the research, but also a fair number of measures that you could look at um, that have looked at this with, um, you know, the NSCA, um, National Science Teachers Association, has done quite a lot of work on this as well with, um, again, that's just kind of your audience. So, yeah, you've got a lot to work with there, um, but I think you've got a lot to draw on as well. So just, just being more specific and just figuring out what you really need to know and what are you going to, what does that information then um, tell you in terms of either taking action or in terms of reporting on a project or program? Yep. And okay. last one. <laughs> There we go. How likely are you to pursue a career in STEM? 
Oh, okay. Um, oh, nice, nice scale there. Um, and so this is another one like a narrative engagement where it's worth looking at um, dimensions, um, components. Uh, because there's, you know, this is kind of comes from the future selves, possible selves kinds of work and STEM identity as well, um, the STEM career particularly. Um, so again, that one question often can answer all of that. But, you know, it's a great start, and sometimes it's all you have space for to get a, a feel for it. Um, but there's a number of um, component questions that are indicators that would also help you get a bigger picture. So if that's of interest, um, you know. Let me know. That's something that we're actually working on with the Code Sci Girls project right now is as a result of these experiences with coding, um, does that have any impact on their interests? There's, you know, there's your knowledge of the careers, your interest in the careers, your behavioral intention are likely to pursue the career. And again, these are high school bio students, so that's a step up too. They're getting a little bit closer to college. Um, that means something different than it does to middle school students, but um, but yeah, I think that's that's definitely in the right right direction. Um, Cause your, your goal is to increase or motivate. Yeah, awesome. Okay, well, I, I hope that was a little helpful. <laughs> it's a good exercise. Again, I think uh, hopefully for those of you participated in that, it, it gives you, this is a practice, right? It's a practice and you have to keep practicing. Yeah. Don't forget that but you don't do it one time and you're done. The survey is perfect. Absolutely not, right? The program, the problem, you're gonna reframe the problem slightly. So you forget everything through this program. That's it, practice, practice, practice. Yeah, and people are different. Um, and not one question is gonna fit for everybody. Um, and so really honoring that, I think that's, that's to me the most exciting part of this work um, and never forgetting it because it does, um, even well-meaning people tend to collapse. <laughs> people together and, and think that one question will work for everybody or, um, you know, just try to really, you know, so asking yourself the question is a good place to start and then asking people who you are reflective of who your audience really is, is even better. Um, short of that, um, whoever else is in your universe to, to get feedback is good too. Yeah, or and talking to your, you out there. <laughs> yeah, and talking to your users, potential users, some of the questions I saw there, you could easily start talking to them broadly, just having conversations, you know, um, mm -hmm. I like mm -hmm. you, Valerie, your slide on all the different uh, instruments you could use, right? Mm -hmm. uh, even talking one to one initially, before you start writing your survey of thinking about what to do, and listen to them, mm -hmm. listen to how they're answering, right? A question about how likely to pursue STEM or would you take this workshop again? Listen to what's important, right? And then you can extract in terms of those metrics of what's key and linking back to your problem, <laughs> the framing mm -hmm. of your problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Don't forget that a lot. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it's just it's just a kind of a natural progression, <laughs> but <laughs> um, but it's yeah, I would I would just really um, you know the, the art asking questions it's an art and a science, so you want to honor both sides of that, I think, and. Yeah, it's fun. Um, so we have a couple of minutes. Any questions for anybody? That was a lot, but uh, questions. Uh, Valerie's going to be with us on Slack throughout this week, okay? Yeah, and you can so. put the PowerPoint up since, since I wasn't able to share it as beauty. Um, and yeah. but there are some resources towards the end, like you said, that talk about um, places that you can go to look for prior measures and, and so forth and the importance of piloting. Yeah, so we're going to be dropping these on Slack as well. But is there any urgent question that anybody has since we're all here? Um, I guess I would be curious if you have recommendations. You, you mentioned at the start of your talk that a lot of people come to you with, uh, you know, we did this thing, now we want to do an evaluation, and they haven't seen these as an integrated process. And I guess the, I mean, like, it's a hor I mean, it's, it's a big missed opportunity to not have planned the evaluation, obviously. I guess, do you, do you have anything that you suggest to those those people where they can maybe salvage some of the evaluation opportunity that I mean, like they've they've lost a lot, right? But I mean, is there anything that they can do apart from like a follow up email, or is that 
is that maybe the best option or just to like emphasize to them like no you need i mean th this is maybe related also to like budget stuff i i'm i've been part of a lot of projects where like even at the beginning they'll say yes we want to do the evaluation no we don't want to pay for an evaluation and mm -hmm. like what are the free options to do evaluation work and I mean, what do you say to the, these maybe like timid evaluators or people who just don't have a budget? Yeah, <laughs> so in the NSF world, the, uh, the, the nice piece about doing projects for the National Science Foundation is that there's a unspoken and kind of spoken requirement that your evaluation will be roughly 10% of your budget. So. Um, and now that's not always the case because some of these media projects we work on, like an IMAX film is $3 million of nothing for them, right? So saying that we would have maybe 300,000 to work with, sometimes it has to be less because so much goes to production. So budgeting is a thing that has to, but we are generally fairly well protected. Um, now NSF has a requirement that projects also have research. So now we've got this kind of partnership sometimes with researchers or sometimes we're doing both elements. So there's, there's that. Um, but I mean, for the most part, um, so that's the world that I mostly work in and then NIH and NASA and some other funders where evaluation is required. Um, so if I can speak to that probably best. Um, and, but still we find there's a lot of, uh, it's changed in more recent years, but many of the, you know, the media people we work with, it's just, you know, they're scared of it for one, um, because what are, what are you going to be saying about my project? And, um, and so you have to kind of work past that. And so the earlier that you do get that phone call that you can partner and work together on the value of it, especially in the front end and the formative parts versus the summative. The summative is what scares people, I think. So um, it's, it's difficult for creative people too to see that evaluation is going to inform um, their process because it can be intimidating or it just be uncomfortable or unfamiliar. Um, but showing some of the values and giving examples of um, here's a project, you know, where here's what we found out and oh, if we had only known, you know, if you'd only known some of these things before, imagine how that could inform, um, you know, your decisions going forward. Showing value, showing examples, showing people who are doing something similar to what they're doing and the value for them. This kind of testimonials, I think, is goes a long ways. Um, but yeah, like I, like I said, we often get the calls very late in the day that, um, you know, oops, we forgot we needed this, and can you just turn this around? Or, or, or again, like you, like I said, is or expecting you to. I haven't shown you anything and I, I just <laughs> um, but part of that's just not understanding what 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 evaluation is and um, you know the kind of value of, of of it so I think those are value part of it is um, and we haven't found anybody who hasn't um, the, the, the summative part can get challenging because sometimes the findings you know they are not what you hoped um, or not what you intended um, there's usually something there of interest or to learn from but um, all of the prior phases though is is maybe a good buy-in place to start, you know, to kind of get people comfortable with value. Um, and then for them, you know, they, every time you go for another grant, um, be able to show the value, being able to show the lessons learned um, all over the map. Um, that's huge and really important for future funding, you know, because otherwise you say you just did a film on Henry Bates, but well, what did, you know, people learn from it? You know, do people engage with it? We think so. <laughs> Ticket sales are great. You know, you have those metrics, but to be able to really show um, learning experience. Um, so last questions, uh, Saifiq. Hey, sorry, just a quick question. That is, um, is that the founder is normally looking for the um, long-term impact because, you know, the word impact is quite problematic, particularly in the field of education, because you can't really see the impact within a short period of time, um, mostly. But again, you know, um, I believe most of the funder wanted, you know, a, a direct impact, like a you know short term impact, but uh, then um, you know when when we measure the the, the the short term impact, they might not be necessarily sustained for a longer period of time. So is the evaluator or funder is you know um, consider or understand something that we call like um you know um, long impact something like that. Mm -hmm. No, it's a great, great, great question. Um, and so that's where um, the length of the funding is what makes a huge difference. So again, many of the projects we work on are five-year projects, but by the time we see the finished product, it could be year four. And so we literally have a year to finish all evaluation in terms of the summative part of it, in terms of looking at impact. 
Um, so ideally, if that's really an important, if it's something, um, Discover Health, the logic model that I said that has nothing to do with this project, was one where they were able to get in right off at year one. So there were opportunities to follow people over time. Um, so that would be something you'd want to build into the, you know, build into the project that 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 whatever it, that deliverable is or whatever that um, you know program is, that it's something happening very early. So you do have the opportunity to follow over time. Um, but from our standpoint, we're lucky if we can go three to six months after um, a project is implemented. Fantastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, all of you. Um, I look forward to seeing you this Saturday uh, uh, for our next uh, installment. We're going to have some fun with this uh, presenting because you guys are going to have to present at the end of this, right? So we're going to start talking about that early enough to give you some pointers now, and then we'll practice it towards the end, and then you guys will do the real thing. Uh, Valerie, this was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate you. And then we look forward to continuing to engage with you on Slack. And I know there's tons of resources she wants to drop in there. So please, 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 please uh, pay attention to Slack. There'll be lots of stuff going in, in there. And with that, have a great Definitely. week. Yeah, and have a great week, everybody. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks very much. You too. Yeah. 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 Great to meet Thanks everybody. So much.